me switch the first speaker and the second speaker because the first speaker Bo Huang has some technical issues with to log in this uh, uh, go go to webinar. And our first speaker now is Xu Guang Wang, and uh, she is from University of Oklahoma. And uh, her topic is the recent development of uh, simultaneous multi-scale data simulation in hybrid ENR for FE3-based global forecast system and the convection allowing regional prediction system. And uh, please go ahead, Xu Guang. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Ling Fu. And um, yesterday, during the data simulation parallel session, our MAP group from University of Oklahoma gave three talks by Xu, Aaron, and Yongming on our recent recent development of data simulation for uh, conventional allowing hurricane prediction and direct radar and cloudy radiance simulation for continental convex field weather prediction. My talk will focus on the FE3 GFS medium ridge weather prediction application. The specific topic is on multi scale data simulation within hybrid EMR. I will primarily talk about our research and experiments for FE3 GFS. At the end, I will touch briefly about further development of the multi scale data simulation for convective scale prediction. So, this work is mostly done by graduate students and scientists in our MAP lab in collaboration with NOAA colleagues across many NOAA labs, actually, especially Daryl and Ting Lei. So, okay, so why multi-scale data simulation? So the next generation global model becomes conventional allowing, and there will be a lot more advanced in situ and uh, remote sensing observations available. So this requires the next generation data simulation system to analyze both the state and its uncertainty across multiple scales. This is termed as multi-scale data simulation in the rest of my talk. So for sequential data simulation, they account for this multi-scale issue by assigning different influence radius simulation types, for example, radar using 15 kilometer, video sound using a thousand kilometer. However, this approach neglect the fact that each observation actually contains useful information on errors for all resolved skills. For simultaneous multi scale data simulation, it's different in that by constructing the ensemble covariance to reflect multi scale errors and their interactions, it's able to account for the multi scale data simulation issues. And all observations are simulated at once. A good example is the work by Buner and Shiliyeva and they actually construct the multi-scale uh, background ensemble coherence through the scale-aware localization. So the simultaneous MDA allows us to more effectively correct the full range of result skills using all available observations. So we implement this simultaneous multi-scale data simulation in GSI 40 var and extending from the extended control variable approach in the GSI var variation minimization. I will talk primarily about the FE3 GFS experiments. First, start with the implementation MDA in the horizontal, and then the vertical extension. And then I touched briefly about MDA for convex scale prediction. So in part one, we perform five-week continuous cycling DA for uh, the MDA 40 MR system uh, uh, integrated with NCEP for FE3 GFS model. And we designed several experiments to address different questions. W1 means um, not scale aware, so no separation bands. So W1OP is using the operational 40 of our configuration with no scale aware for each level, but it does use level dependent localization. W1300 are scale aware, but uh, then they use a fixed localization uh, with like larger localization radius and smaller localization radius. W2, W3 are two um, a, a multi scale data simulation experiments. W2 means we decompose into two bands. W3 means three bands. Cross here represents that we are trying to consider the cross band correlation. No cross means we neglect the interaction between the two bands. So after we implement the code, 
The first thing we did is to do a single observation experiment. Uh, for those of you who are new to data simulation, I know this is a preliminary session. We often use single observation experiment to see whether the result is within our theoretical expectation. So I always advise my students to perform this to see whether you, that we can interpret the results to be consistent with the theory of data simulation. So what's shown in the color is the uh, analysis increment by assimilating a single observation at a green dot. Analysis increment means the correction made to the first gas field by assimilating the single observation. So in general, this is within our expectation. For this, those scale and aware approach, for example, using shorter localization, you have more of a constraint increment compared to using a longer localization. This two multi-scale approach actually produce um, the increments reflecting both the large scale increments and also in the same time reduce the noise, noise increments for the small scales. So this is within our expectation. Comparing the approach considering cross-band correlation, it shows a secondary peak here. This is because the cross was able to consider the cross-band correlation for small large scales here. So this is showing the analysis increment after simulating all observations. This is plotted as a function of weight number. So you're seeing this as a function of scales. And um, Again, this is the correction made to the first guess by simulating observations. At large scales, you see our MPA approach was able to produce uh, analysis uh, consistent with W1-1000. At smaller scales, it produced increment similar to W1-300. Uh, okay, so the question, would this be transferred into the forecast improvement or not? And this is showing a six hour background forecast verified against radio sound observations. And we're using the operational 40 mark configuration as a reference here. Whenever you see a curve on the left of that line, that shows the new MDA actually produced a better forecast. So this is indeed the case for both W2 MDA implementation. We see the improvement of both wind temperature compared to the operational scale and aware approach. So what about longer forecast lead time? This is uh, verified against European, European Central Real Analysis uh, as a function of lead time and also pressure, uh, vertical level. So this is again using operational configuration as a reference. And whenever you're seeing blue color, that means the, the other experiment is better. So if you look at the first two columns, the scale and aware approach using fixed localization show degradation on certain levels compared to the operational configuration. But if we use MDA approach, it was able to show improvement for almost all the time and vertical levels we considered. This is true for both no cross and cross, which is encouraging. Now, is there any value to consider cross-band correlation in the MDA? And this is showing the difference between cross and no cross when I was seeing blue color that means considering cross-band correlation is beneficial. This is the case if you look at a longer forecast lead time. At short lead time, uh, cross flow degradation compared to using no cross-band correlation. Okay, this slide summarizes the global forecast error. And um, for all six experiments, using the operational skill and aware approach as a reference. Again, whenever you're seeing blue, that's showing the other experiments better. And um, so this is plotting in different space. This forecast lead time in X axis, Y axis showing the scales. So it's telling you the story in different space. So in the W1 skill and aware approach, they both show degradation compared to the operational skill and aware but level dependent approach. When we use W, uh, sorry, multi skill data simulation, it shows overall improvements. And especially when you consider cross-band correlation shown in these two figures, D and F. And for example, you show the maximum in improvement at longer lead time at a wave band around like eight to 10, a wave number eight to 10. Uh, using three wave band doesn't seem to show a systematic improvement compared to using just two bands. Okay, in part one, we only implement MBA in the horizontal. And in part two, we further extend MD in the vertical. This is because when we look at a global 
vertical cartilage perturbations averaged over the whole globe, you found, okay, if you have a lar larger horizontal scale that tend to also be associated with a, a, a larger vertical scale as well. And also, if you look at uh, correlation of perturbation in the vertical for, uh, for a grip on your hurricane, it's also more, more interesting because in this case, the small scale actually have, has a larger vertical extent compared to the, 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 the horizontally large scales. This motivates us to further expand MDA for vertical, especially we want to decompose the vertical into different scales for a given horizontal scale. So then we perform single observation tests as I introduced earlier. Um, so using hurricane case and also subtropical high case, all these experiments are actually the same in terms of horizontal MDA, same as part one. The only difference is on the vertical component. We basically further decompose the vertical component into different bands for a given horizontal scale and apply different localization for different scales in the vertical. So this is uh, showing a result for subtropical high and hurricane. If you look at subtropical high, the results is within our expectation. This figure over here is using the vertical MDA approach. And if you look closely on the increment, okay, this increment for the vertical cross section, the vertical extent is in between a fixed vertical realization using smaller localization and a fixed vertical realization using a larger localization. So this is also within our expectation. So then we move on to perform a cycling experiments. By the time of the workshop, we were able to perform one week worth of cycling, but the results I think is very promising. As you can tell for the vertical extension of MDA, it actually has a better six hour forecast compared to just consider horizontal multi-scale data simulation. It's true for both wind temperature. So the program manager office asked us to prepare a summary slide. So basically, briefly speaking, we implemented and developed the MD approach within the operation 40 of our system. This is done for both horizontal and a vertical. Our site experiments have shown that uh, this new MD8 assimilation improved the global forecast uh, relative to current operational 40 of our configuration. Vertical MDA shows additional promises. Okay, so I will touch briefly about MDA for convex scale and WP. Convex scale and WP itself is a multi-scale problem. So the idea is similar. However, convex scale has this own, uh, unique challenge. This is where the R&D comes into play. So I will show, not show details, but just brief uh, illustration. This is May 8, 2003, Oklahoma City Tornet Supercell. So for a long time, radar data summary community just used radar to confine to updated storms. Based on our MDA theory, the radar observation can also correct the skills beyond the storm itself. This is shown in this uh, May 8th case. If you use MDA, the radar was not only able to correct the storm, but also the near storm environment, for example, with the enhanced low level jet and convergence. This actually was translated into the forecast. It's 45 minutes, uh, four kilometer updraft, and also vertical vorticity forecast. And for the May 8th case, you can see the tornado damage track over here. So the forecast was pretty good for both. However, using the MDA approach, it was able to produce a much stronger storm maintained for a longer time. This is illustrated the power of MDA approach to best use the single source data correct multiple scales. Okay, this is my last slide. This is just summarizing our very short term and long term MDA work uh, research plans. And some of them are beyond current funding cycles, but I thought it's a good idea to share our long term goal of performing research to advance MDA uh, area. So we want to continue experiments to optimize the vertical MDA in FA3GFS. We want to address multi-scale data simulation by integration with the one of our recent development, multi-resolution DA. We want we also have developed a new multi-scale data sim algorithm in pure ensemble filter. We want to further advance that, and we want to um, use objective methods to determine the scale separation and localization, and also apply this multi-scale idea for various different applications, ranging ranging from CAM, Arcan 
MRW, even S2S down the road, long term. Okay, that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Xu Guang, and uh, for a great talk. And uh, do we have questions on Slack? There are currently no questions on Slack. Okay. So uh, we can. So maybe we should uh, move on. In, so let's see. The next speaker will be the will be Bo Huang from Series CU Border. And his topic is development of a hybrid ensemble variational aerosol data simulation system with Jedi. Okay, go ahead, Bo. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I make my laptop just crashed. So can you see the whole screen now? Yes, uh, we can hear you and see your slides. Okay, great, thanks. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bo Huang. I work with Maris at BU Series and uh, NOAA GSL. Uh, the title of the talk today is Development of Hybrid Ensemble Variation Aerosol Data Assimilation System with Jedi. Uh, this, is your, uh, this is a three year NOAA funded project. Before I continue, I would like to thank our co authors, Corey and Daryl from uh, NSTEP EMC and Dan from GCSBA and Shuba from NASA GMAO and Xiaoyang from South Dakota State University. Also, we would like to thank our collaborators, Alindo from NASA GMAO and Benjamin from GCSDA and George from uh, GSL and Sarah from U Albany University. Uh, in the meantime, we also would like to thank Sway from U, U Albany for his help with the MATLAB software developed by DTC and Lee and Judy from GSL for their help to set up the GFS F3 go-kart model and help with the uh, uh, workflow. Uh, this is the outline of the talk today. The first part is about the system development, then followed by some results of our cycle assimilation experiments using MATLAB for evaluation. Then ongoing and future work will be, will be discussed in the last part of the talk. So data assimilation combines model forecasts or background with information from observations to obtain the best estimate of the true state. Right now, the joint effort for data assimilation integration is the next generation unified DA system is being developed at GCSDA. So far, we developed 3D MR FGAT ensemble-based DA capability within JEDI for assimilating AOD retrievals to improve global aerosol analysis and forecasts. The following bullets summarize the tasks we have completed so far. First, the models and various AOD retrievals were first thinned and processed in a format that is suitable for interface for observation data access framework in JEDI. Second, an AOD observation operator was developed using aerosol optical properties in the CRTM and include in the unified forward of, uh, of observation operator framework in JEDI. So the figure on the top shows an example of the various AOD retrievals from NOAA as NPP polar uh, satellites. And the bottom figure shows a CRTM simulated AOD using the uh, forecast from the uh, GFS F3 go-kart model. So as you can see, even though the simulated AOD has smaller magnitudes, they share very similar uh, patterns. Uh, F3 GDI interface for go-kart aerosols for, uh, for variational minimization was developed. In the current, the NKF capability in JEDA is not available. So to provide the ensemble-based background covariances, the operational, the NCEP operational NKF system was adapted to the F3 grade, native F3 grade, uh, what used in our current system. Chris Van Nili, the observation operator, was also developed for the adapted NKF system. In the, uh, so far, all the components in above was integrate, were integrated in the NCEPS operational global DA workflow for future operational applications. Uh, this slide summary uh, shows a simplified uh, flowchart of, uh, of this system. In a hybrid ensemble variational aerosol data assimilation system, it consists of two major components. The first one is the variational component. It runs one control forecast. After the MRA update, it produces one control analysis, which is advanced to next cycle to provide the background forecast. The second component is the NKF component. It runs 
uh, multiple ensemble members after NKF, it produced key member analysis, which are for the advanced to next cycle to provide the background forecast. So here in the INVAR updates, oh, sorry. Uh, in the INVAR updates, the, back, the ensemble based background covariance comes from the key member ensemble uh, background forecasts. So this part highlights our contribution to the JEDI uh, system to accommodate the aerosol data assimilation capability. So as I mentioned earlier, the AOD retrievals were first processed to IOTA format, which are for the input in the UFO to calculate the HUFX, which are for the used for INKF and the INVAR updates. So as you can see, as you can see here, the INKF were using the NCEF, ad adapted in NCEF uh, INKF system. Once the JEDI, uh, JEDI INKF in cap capability is ready, we're going to replace this part with the JEDA RT cap. The model we use in this uh, in our experiments is GF, GFS F3 3 go kart model, where the F3 3 based GFS model was coupled with go kart aerosols. Basically, it is a, it is a gaps aerosol model which already introduced by Lee and uh, uh, Barry this this morning. So we run this model at a reduced resolution, about 100 kilometer. So in this model, it has 15 uh, aerosol species. For example, five sites been dust and five sites been sea salt and hydrophobic and hydrophilic, organic and black carbon and sulfate. So the figures on the right gives an example of the monthly average column integral for dust, sea salt, total carbon and sulfate in June 2016. For the emission source files, we applied blended global biomass burning emission products and fire rigidity product. The chemistry is coupled with a core match model through new ops interface in here. Uh, the observations we are simulated in our experiments is um, uh, AOD retrievals at 550 nanometer derived from NOAA beers on board the SOMI NPP satellites. We performed six hourly assimilation of AOD within three hours of the analysis time so the animation figures on the right shows the uh, coverage of assimilated, assimilated AOD at each cycle. The serial in TF and the 3D MR are used to calculate increments for aerosol concentration. The max variable in our current experiments are not updated, but corrected by adding regulated increments from operational GDAS uh, analysis. The in TF run 20 member ensemble at the same resolution of the control, about 100 kilometer. And our cycled AOD experiments run the four months of June 2016 after three week model spin up in May 2016. So during our D, uh, D period, cycle D period, there is a dust event in Saharan. We're gonna look at the AOD impact in the next, uh, in the next slide on this event. Uh, in the meantime, a parallel, a parallel experiment without AOD DA was also performed to more clearly uh, reveal to investigate the AOD impact. So here we first look at the AODD impact on Sahar Saharan dust storm in June 2016. Those three figures choose the AOD. The left figure choose the AOD retrievals during the during this event period. And the middle and the right figure, enemy figures choose the CRTM simulated AOD from the six hour background forecast before the AODDA and the corresponding analysis after AODDA. So as you can see compared to the AOD retrievals, the background actually, and in general, underestimates the AOD in terms of the magnitude and also the uh, pattern. After the AOD assimilation, it has a better match with the AOD uh, observations in both the magnitude and also the, the pattern. So actually here, the AOD shows positive impact on this dust event. Then we run some, uh, some innovation statistics. So the top, Two figures choose the bias and RMSE against assimilated various AOD for no DA. That means six hour forecast in a no AOD DA, no DA experiment. And for DA background and DA analysis, that corresponds to the six hour background forecast and corresponding analysis in the uh, AOD DA experiment. And the bar plot shows the average bias and RMSE over the whole month cycling. So as you can see in here, after assimilating AOD, it, it is able to reduce the negative bias and also the uh, error of the simulated, simulated AOD. The bottom figure shows the error and the spread of the ensemble background. 
For a robust ensemble forecast system, we expect a good consistency between the error and the spread. So as you can see in here, our current system still suffer from severe uh, spread deficiency issue in the current. So one of our current and future work is trying to find, trying to find efficient means to increase the spread. Then we compared the six hour forecast, forecast with and without AODDA with uh, the reanalysis from NASA MERO2 and uh, ECMWF CAMS model. So uh, the four figures choose the monthly and globally average mixing ratio profiles for dust, sulfate, and sea salt, and total carbon. So if you can look, uh, for example, the top two figures, as you, uh, the, the, the six hour forecast in the DA, DA experiment shows a very good match with the reanalysis from both uh, NASA MERO2 and also the CAMS, uh, the ECMWF CAMS model compared to the NODI experiments of blue curve. However, the difference between the, the difference between DA and no DA in sea salt is very tiny here. Uh, we found that the reason is because the uh, the spread for sea salt species is still too tiny, so that's why the difference in here is very tiny. And also, we realized if you focus on uh, the reanalysis from NASA MERO2 and also the reanalysis from EC CAMS model, they also show very large different vertical patterns in there. So I think uh, we think this, this is related to the model configuration and different uh, data assimilation method and also how the AOD was calculated. Uh, for example, in the MERO2 model, the dust and sea salt has a five size beam, five, five beams and the uh, in, the, in the EC, they only have three beams and also they, they, they are being spun over a different range and also the assumption on size distribution in each beam is also different. So it suggests that for the AOD, uh, for the aerosol forecast and DSU has a lot of light uncertainty in there. Uh, this figure with shows the monthly average dust column integral of the bias and RMSE in the no DA and the DA experiments against NASA MERO2 reanalysis and ECMWF reanalysis. So if you compare the second row with the first row, you can see uh, the six hour forecast in the DA experiment is able to reduce the negative bias, is able to reduce the bias and also the error for the dust column integral compared to both the NASA MERO2 reanalysis and EC CAMS reanalysis. Uh, this figure shows the uh, AOD comparison in here. So different from the dust column integral in the last slide, we see here in our current experiment, both in DA experiment and no DA experiments, the forecast shows um, globally negative bias. We found, we think this is related to some inefficiency of the CRTM with regard to the uh, calculation of the, the AOD calculation. But uh, we still see that uh, the DA experiment actually is able to reduce the bias compared to the no DA, reduce both the bias and the error compared to the no DA experiment. So this system is still under development, so there's still a lot of work we, we can do and we hope to do. So for the verification part, we, we are trying to further verify our model against uh, the independent, uh, not independent observations, for example, the aeronet observations and also some other independent retrievals. For the, for the, for the system, we are we're also trying to further develop the static B matrix aerosol species. Right now, the B matrix in our current system is not realistic. Also, also in our current system, the INVAR analysis does not feed back to the ensemble analysis. So we are trying to further develop, develop the recentering procedure that the ensemble analysis will be recentered around the control analysis. And also, Due to the limited, limited competition resources, our current system applies the same low resolution for both control and ensemble. We would like to further develop the dual resolution capability for ensemble at a lower resolution and control at a higher resolution. As I mentioned earlier, we may have some problem with the AOD calculation in CRTM. So we would, we would like to further improve the representation of the relative properties of aerosols and in, in CRTM and improve the AOD calculation. In the meantime, we would also like to develop a forward AOD operator based on NASA's table to see if it can show some difference, like how to deal with some a negative bias in here. To improve the AOD assimilation, we're also trying to first improve the system uh, with, with respect to applying variational bias so that the model bias can be accounted for in the assimilation. And also we are trying to 
improve the ensemble spread by applying stochastic perturbations to emissions and parameterizations, and also accounting for the non-Gaussian AOD error distribution. So that's all I have today. So thanks for your attention, and I'm, I'm glad to take, take your questions. And I'm sorry again for the inconvenience in the very beginning of this uh, talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Bo, actually, for a great talk. And uh, we do have uh, time for one or two quick questions. OK. All right, so uh, first question is from Steve Elbers. Um, is it possible to assimilate aerosol-affected radiances directly using a combination of observed IR and visible channels? This would bypass the intermediate step of using the AOD retrievals. It is possible to assimilate AOD-affected radiances. I'm not sure of this one yet. Maybe Maris can answer this question. Maybe if he can comment on this Slack bot. Yeah, uh, I think Maris cannot speak, so he can comment. Okay, please yeah, uh, follow Maris up this question through the Slack. Okay, second question. Uh, second question is from Shi Guang Wang. So, what is your plan to? Do oh, that was ahead of. Um, why not directly assimilate radiance? So okay. here we are, we are not. This one not directly assimilate radiance. In this project, we are not trying to assimilate the radiance. We are trying to assimilate the AOD. So it's different observations. So the, the goal of this project is trying to assimilate AOD, not uh, in not the radiance right now. Okay. Uh, I think uh, in interest of time, we should move on. Uh, our next speaker is Zhong Qi Tong uh, from University of Oklahoma. Uh, his topic is direct assimilation of radar data within the GSI ENKF and the hybrid EN3 VAR, 3D VAR system for the standalone regional FE3 based unified forecast system at a convection allowing system. Uh, so please go ahead, uh, Zhong Qi. Hi, uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Chong Chi Tong uh, from CAPS University of Oklahoma. I'm working with uh, Dr. Ming She and Chen Si Liu, uh, Yang Sang Jun. And uh, here I would like to especially uh, acknowledge it to our collaborator from the uh, DS, uh, from for the GSD, uh, the Jeff Duda is our collaborators, which I don't have time to put on. Uh, our first slide here. So uh, today I'm talking, going to talk about our uh, implementation of the direct radar uh, assimilation at CAPS uh, into the operational GSD, uh, GF, GSI systems. So here's the introduction. Uh, the hybrid EM bar coupled with the ENKF is preferred uh, DA method for the UFS at both global and regional scales. So due to the high nonlinearity of radar reflectivity operators, uh, direct assimilation of the Z data variationally in 3D bar and hybrid EM bar has several significant issues and difficulties. Um, Shu Guangwang's group uh, proposed to treat the Z as an additional control variable to avoid the use of the reflectivity operators within the cost function. Uh, there is a talk uh, given yesterday uh, by Yong Ming Huang. And uh, when doing so, the effect of Z uh, in the static D part of hybrid EM bar can only be achieved via pre calculated statistical derived covariances, uh, while there's uh, no link, direct link between the Z and other uh, like hydrometer variables are included. So at CAPS, we have developed several key... Uh, someone talking? Okay, at CAPS, uh, we have developed several key techniques uh, that overcome those difficulties and implemented them within the GSI ENKF and EN 3D bar and tested with the SAR FV3 targeting the three kilometer rapid rapid refresh focus system application. So we have also uh, in the very last of the, our talk, I will briefly talk about our achievement on the initial test with the JGI 3D bar uh, for the reflectivity assimilation. 
So the uh, key enhancement uh, to the GSI EMVAR and ENKF for radar DA we have uh, developed at CAPS, including these uh, for ENKF and EN3D VAR, the reflectivity Z operators and its A joint consistent with uh, either single moment or double moment microphysics scheme are developed. And uh, we have also introduced special treatment that is required by, uh, associated with this agent and operators uh, about the variable transform to ensure proper behavior of variational min minimization and accurate uh, analysis increments. And we develop, uh, also developed the multi steel ENKF and EN3D VARDA in the GSI system too. Uh, for the 3D VAR and hybrid EN 3D VAR temperature dependent static hydro hydrometer background error profiles to ensure physical hydrometer analysis by 3D VAR uh, is introduced. And we use the logarithmic mixing ratio as com control variables for more efficient convergence of the cost function for the variational DA approach. Uh, the use of general power transform of QX, which is the hydrometer mixing ratio as control variable is another advanced uh, techniques that we introduced. And uh, these, uh, these techniques introduced listed above are, can support both uh, one and two moment microphysics schemes and the state variables. And uh, uh, these capabilities also has been tested uh, with both Wolf and SAR FV3. And the following in the following talk, I'm gonna focus on the test with SAR FV3 result, uh, which has been submitted to the GRL for publication and it's under review. So here is the case we uh, selected to do our case study for the SAR FV3 and radar DA test. So this is basically is a stationary frontal uh, induced uh, storm cluster systems happens around the Oklahoma and in, in the central plains area. And that in, in, uh, result in a lot of severe hazard on that day. And this is the DA experiment uh, and the uh, uh, configuration of, of our experiment. So the SAR FV3 domain we're using is the flag uh, denoted by this flag block here. And it has 450 by 450 degree points with the um, around three kilometers risk, risk spacing and with vertical level of 63. And all our verification are focused uh, in the middle central, the red three, 100 by 300 verification domain because uh, we found uh, some uh, lateral boundary forcings uh, that would happen, especially on the upstream. So we want to uh, exclude that effect in our verifications. So this is why we choose this verification uh, domain, smaller one. And the experiment will initialize the using the uh, GS, GFS, ENKF, the GDAS uh, ensemble members, and we run one hour spin up forecast until 19Z and we start our DA from this point and we use one hour cycling uh, frequent uh, DA cycling with every 15 minutes we assimilate the both radar reflectivity and radio velocity uh, at the hours we assimilate additional conventional data in addition to the radar data and we also uh, perform different experiment with different uh, DA methods, including the pure 3D VAR ENKF and the, the EN 3D VAR with different weights. Uh, one is 100%, which it will be denoted as the pure EN 3D VAR and 75% ensemble-based background error variance for the hybrid one. So here is a plot that gives you the composite Z of the uh, first analysis results for each uh, for different experiments, DA experiment, and compared to the background, you can see even with one cycle, uh, the effectiveness of different radar DA is shown. Uh, some method is actually slower at retrieving proper intensity of storm, like the ENKF uh, for the like the northern Kansas area, uh, it's much weaker compared to other approaches. 
And here is the Rooming Square Innovation Statistics through the DA cycles, uh, the one hour DA cycles. And uh, as shown here, we can see this is for the reflectivity uh, verification. So we also include this control, which is a no DA uh, experiment as a referential experiment to see the, uh, the impact of the DA. And so we see regardless of the DA method, all DAs can uh, give you much better the rooming square innovations better than the control one, which is no DA. So for the Z here, we can see that the 3D bar and the hybrid one, uh, it fits the observation better at the analysis, which gives you smaller rooming square innovation. Uh, but it also gives you a uh, much larger forecast error growth compared to the uh, ENKF and the pure EN3 divide, which gives you much smaller forecast error growth. For the VR, the 3D VAR shows distinctly worse analysis and forecast, and the other three experiments are relatively similar. Uh, exclude, uh, the ENKF is actually gives you the lowest uh, Remy square innovation. And here is uh, the final analysis at the very first row and the two hour and the four hour forecast. The still is the composite reflectivity, the observation and different uh, DA. So we didn't include the pure EN3 bar here because the limit of the space. So here we can see we want to point out that uh, the 3D bar is actually experiencing a uh, dissipation, quick dissipation within the first 15 minutes of the forecast. So this, like this uh, two hour forecast of the 3D bar, like this convective line is actually uh, revealed from that dissipation. So it's not like uh, from the ENKF and the hybrid, uh, hybrid ENKF, they, this system like maintained all the time from the very beginning. So also at the uh, end of the forecast, the four-hour forecast, we can see the uh, linear structure of the storm uh, is missing by the 3D bar uh, while it's captured by other experiments, the best captured by the ENKF here. So also we want to point out that uh, the pure EN 3D bar result is somehow similar to the best similar to the ENKF, but with more like over over forecast tendencies. It, it uh, even produced some spurious echoes at some like area that's didn't shown in the ENKF. So here we get this uh, neighborhood verification for the composite reflectivity. So the threshold is 25 dB, which is exceeding the light range. So throughout the four hour fo forecast, uh, period, we can see that the ENCAF gives you the highest ATS score, while the 3D bar gives you the worst. And you can see this sudden drop uh, within the first 15 uh, minutes. It's the dissipating of the storm. And it also happens to the, hy uh, the hybrid one. But uh, there is no sudden drop for the pure, either pure EN 3D bar or ENKF. So it may be due to the, um, the advantage of using the ensemble flow dependent based background error covariance. And the hybrid EN3D bar uh, score uh, quickly catch up after one hour, catch up to be very close to the ENKF. And here is on the right is the performance diagrams uh, for every the hourly forecast results. Again, we can see that the high, highest uh, probability of detection is provided uh, by the pure EN3D bar. Also, it has the highest uh, positive bias uh, given to uh, its over forecast tendency. So another uh, verification we did is the neighborhood probability of the four hour forecast maximum uh, updraft velocity larger than 75. And here uh, we see overall all experiments can, oh, the the SPC severe weather reports are overlaid as these tri different color triangles. And uh, as you can see that uh, for all DA, they can pretty much catch the uh, main groups of the severe weather here. Uh, but certain location displacement actually shown in different uh, experiments. For example, like the 3D bars uh, 
basically missing the uh, this severe weather here at the Oklahoma south southwest Oklahoma border. So in general, the hybrid shows the hybrid here shows the much the highest confidence on the tornadoes events around the four state corners, while the pure EN3 bar again gives you the most extensive larger than 30% NP because it has this over focused tendencies. So the summary of the case study results uh, we present above is that directed radar DA, uh, including Z and VR capabilities are impl implemented within the GSI that supports pure EN3 DVAR, hybrid EN3 DVAR, and ENCAF with needed special treatments. The system is interfaced with SAR FV3, and the case study of the swarm cluster is performed to examine the effectiveness of the implementation and their relative performance. During the DA cycles, the 3 var and hybrid EN3 var analysis fits the uh, Z observation better, while the ENKF and the pure EN3 var produce much smaller focused error. Overall, the ENKF produces the highest EPS within the four hour forecast lens we examined, uh, while the 3 var has the largest uh, under forecasting tendency and the pure EN3 var has largest over forecasting tendency. The hybrid EN3 bar shows the best forecast uh, scale in terms of predicted updraft velocity track compared to the severe weather report from the NWS. So here uh, I will also introduce some uh, more Thank advanced. You have well, one minute left. Okay, uh, this is some additional tech. Uh, capabilities we introduce in our direct DA. So here shows the V operators. Uh, so you, as you can see uh, for the EN3 DVR experiment with the double moment and single moment operators, the double moment one can better capture like this storm here. And uh, there is other uh, implementation about the power transform control variables. So uh, compared to the log transformed of the Q vectors, it, the power one gives you the better confidence on the UH track here. And the one, uh, the power form conversion of the uh, Q and NT, which is the total number concentration also gives you the higher EPS. And this is uh, a simple example of our multi-scale DA. So we can see with the multi-scale DA, this is a 12 hour forecast. It recaptured this stretch form uh, precipitation better than the single scale EMCAP. And the last, we will show our uh, achievement on the JDI 3D VAR uh, used to assimilate the re uh, Z reflectivity here. So this is the observation as we go through the four outer loop, we can see that, that our implementation gives you the reasonable result to match the uh, observation better after four outer loop. And here is the cost function uh, minimization. I mean, the innovations of the Z here. So uh, this is all I got. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Gongqi, uh, uh, and uh, in interest of time, we really don't have time to have questions, but uh, I do see there's a Slack questions, comments, and uh, everyone should go, go there to uh, uh, check that out. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Clara Juper and uh, from NOAA Israel PSD. Uh, her topic is accounting for land modeling uncertainties in UFS ensembles, ensemble forecast and the development of a coupled land atmosphere data simulation for the US at NOAA SRO PS, uh, PSL. Uh, please go ahead, Clara. Sure, thanks. So I'm gonna have to restart if I allow it to record. So I'm just gonna decline that. Can I still accept um, presenting? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so you cannot show your screen, right? Do you so I'm clicking on the green share my screen. Oh, hang on. Can you see my presentation? No. no. Okay. What do I need to do? Change presenter? Hang on. How about now? Uh, okay. Please. Oh, hang on a sec. I found. No, as far as I, I think I'm presenting. 
Yeah, you are a presenter. Okay. And, uh, You're the presenter. Can you see my slide? Can you see my slides? No. Okay. No. Okay. Um, if not, I can hand it. Yeah. Why don't we try again? Back to you. Okay. Um, let me give it to myself. Okay. So it's gone now. All right. And then to you. All right. Let's try again. Okay. Show my screen. I've got it this time. All right. How's that? Uh, not show up. Okay. Um, does someone else maybe want to show my slides? I've put them in the folder. Might that be faster? It might be. Let me... Hang on. So it says sharing, yeah. not showing anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, Hang on. Try. How about that? Maybe Catherine, you can try to okay. show uh, Clara's slides. Can you do that? Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing it in the. I wasn't sure what number to put yeah. on it, so I put 14 slash 4. It's funny because it's showing me as present, like it's telling me I'm presenting, but I'm not showing anything. Um, I think I use random buttons. I can make other people present. <laughs> Sorry about this. I you, presented this you morning in a different the, meeting and it was fine. The planary DA and ensemble predictability folder. I thought I did. Why don't I just, should I email it to somebody? <sighs> Sorry, I'm just pulling up the um, abstract again. What's the quick, quickest way for me to find the folder? I put in the last night. Where's the click quickest link to the folder? Okay. Yeah, can we put that to Slack channel? Sure. Yep, I can do that. Oh, I'm on Slack through the internet. I'm assuming that'll work. So uh, if I could briefly interrupt, Clara's yes. slides are in the parallel session for DA. Oh, I put them in the wrong place. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Evan. I am just pulling them down right now and I will I'll share them. Yeah, sorry about this. I presented in a different go-to meeting this morning and everything was fine, so I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Uh, I have okay. okay, good. Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, everyone. I'll, I'll and I'll get started as quickly as I can and um, try to make up some time. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, some work that I've been doing to improve the representation of land model uncertainty in the UFS ensembles. Um, I think I said in my original um, abstract that I was also going to talk about some of the land DA work we're doing at Ezreal. Um, in retrospect, that was a bit vicious for a 15 minute talk. So if you're interested in that, maybe just send me an email and we can set up a phone call. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for some background here is that NWP systems um, across the board underestimate the model uncertainty in and near the land surface in their um, ensemble systems. Um, and this isn't really a surprise because they, they currently don't have any method to account for uncertainty in the land models. And so in this project, I wanted to better represent that land model uncertainty in the ensembles. This has some value in its own right in terms of being able to improve uh, the forecast uncertainty. But my interest here really is that it then enables us to do an ensemble based land DA within our atmospheric system. I should also highlight here that what I'm really trying to do is understand the way that the model responds to different representations of land model uncertainty rather than representing a sort of final system that I would recommend for the UFS. 
Um, that I'm aware of, there are no ensemble-based land DA methods currently being used in atmospheric systems. Um, and so as a starting point for this, I went to the offline land DA community where they're just using the land model itself separated from the atmosphere, where ensemble DA is, has a very long history. Typically, they create their ensembles um, by doing one of three things, uh, perturbing the atmospheric forcing fields, um, perturbing the model states at regular intervals, or perturbing the model parameters. However, it's really the first two that are the most common and that I know it that I know of, they're the two methods that are used in all operational land DA systems, including GLDAS um, at ENC. Next slide, please. Um, before I continue, I just want to take a quick diversion to talk about land model behaviour and some of the ways that it differs from atmospheric model behaviour um, in, in terms of uh, what's relevant to this. Um, th there are two big issues. The one, one is that the land is strongly forced, which means that over time it will converge to a state determined by its forcing. Um, this is very different to the atmosphere and, and the big consequence here is that we don't have that sensitive dependence on initial conditions that we see in the atmosphere. And so we're not actually going to get a lot of understanding of land model uncertainty by simply perturbing our initial conditions. And that's why in offline land DA they tend to perturb the states at every single model time step. The second big one is that land surface models as they use in atmospheric systems don't simulate horizontal flow between the grid cells. So that means that you're going to get no horizontal communication of uncertainty information between grid cells. So again, this is very different to the atmosphere. And one of the big consequences of this is that the horizontal distribu distribution of uncertainty in an ensemble represented by an ensemble system is going to look a lot like the horizontal distribution of the uncertainty that you fed it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so coming back to um, NSEP's uh, ensemble system. So what I've got here is just to demonstrate that statement I made earlier that uh, currently um, the ensembles are underrepresenting uh, model uncertainty in the land and near the land. These images on the right here, um, the top one is for soil moisture in the layer closest to the atmosphere, and the bottom one is for two meter um, temperature. And what I'm showing is the error standard deviation. The plots on the left are my best estimate of the model error standard deviation based on comparison to independent observations. And then what I'm showing on the right is the current ensemble standard deviation. And so you see straight away there that um, we are badly underestimating both of those. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so you recall I said before that in offline land systems, um, one of the ways that they introduce um, model uncertainty is by perturbing the atmospheric forcing fields. And so what I did first was I had a look at what the spread looks like in our ensembles of the important terms that force the land surface. Um, and the three main terms that tend to be perturbed in offline systems are precipitation, short wave and long wave, which is what I've, I've plotted in each of those columns. I'm going to skip over the details in this slide in the interest of time, but in the top row I've basically got the ensemble spread that's used in GLDAS. Um, and in the bottom row, I've got the ensemble spread that we're getting from um, ENC's current operational ensemble system. Um, for precip and shortwave down, you can see that we're in the right ballpark. Um, and I should also point out that the, the methods that are used in land DA are based on a loose understanding of, of what we think the actual model uncertainty is. For shortwave on the, uh, sorry, for long wave on the right, um, we've, we're much, much lower than what's used in offline systems. However, that 50 watts per meter squared value that's used in offline systems is, is known to be an overestimate. And part of the reason they overestimate that is that they're not perturbing their um, atmospheric temperatures. So I'm actually pretty comfortable with that. And so what this tells me is that the lack of spread in the land surface in, in EMC's ensembles isn't due to a lack of spread in the atmospheric fields that are forcing that land surface. And so a consequence of this is that if we, if we want to perturb if we want to increase the spread in the land surface, then we're going to have to find a way to directly or indirectly perturb the land states. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and so that's what I've done in this first set of experiments is I've tested two different ways to directly perturb the soil states. In the first one, I um, am stochastically perturbing the soil moisture and soil temperature at each time step in each model layer. Um, and this is just the standard approach that's used in offline land DA systems. Um, in the second method, well, so one of the problems with this first method is that you basically assume a correlation between the errors that you're introducing in soil moisture and in soil temperature. Um, but the thing is the relationship between soil moisture and soil temperature can change over time and you, you can't capture that. So in the second method, I tried to use SPPT um, or stochastically perturbed physics tendencies to 
create the perturbations that I applied to soil moisture and soil temperature. And that the attraction to this approach was that the model, the model uh, physics would give me that relationship between the soil moisture and soil temperature perturbations at, at each time step. Okay, next slide. Very quickly, the experimental design, 30 ensemble members at about half degree, um, using the 3 dvr hybrid DA, initial conditions came from operational output and ran forward a little bit. Um, and then I've reported results after 30 days during a summer period when land atmosphere coupling is the strongest. Next slide. Okay, so look at the results. This is a bit of a busy slide, so I'll just go through it. If we start with the, with the plot on the left, um, what I've got here is the x-axis is the mean um, wetness fraction in soil moisture in, in level one. So this is basically the soil moisture scale between zero driest possible at that location and one wettest possible at that location. The um, y-axis is the error standard deviation. Um, the red line is the target soil moisture error distribution. So this is what I've, I've this is binned obviously into the uh, different bins of, of wetness fraction. And this is my observation based estimate of the model error standard deviation. So this is what I want my ensemble to look like. The black line at the bottom is the current ensemble system. So you see the distribution is actually reasonable, but um, it's just way too low. The turquoisey line that's um, skewed is my method one. So that's when I di add, directly add perturbations to the soil moisture and soil temperature at each model time step. And you see here, this has been quite effective at adding spread in dry conditions, but less effective in wet conditions. And this is related to the memory of, um, or the, the persistence of, of model soil moisture. It basically persists for much longer in dry conditions. So the model is retaining the perturbations that I'm adding when it's dry, but it's not, retain not retaining them for as long when it's wet. Um, then the dark green line, just above the black line, second from the bottom, is my SPPT. Um, and so you see it's added a very small amount of um, spread on top of what we already had in the baseline system. And this is a known issue with SPPT um, applied to soil states. The problem here, so the way SPPT works is you basically take the change in, in the variable over the time step and then hit it with a perturbation. And the problem that we have with applying SPPT to soil moisture is that soil moisture barely changes during most time steps. Unless it's recently rained, you don't see much change. So it doesn't really matter what size perturbation you hit that change with. If, if you didn't have much change, it's not going to create much spread. Okay, next slide, please. Moving on to look at the impacts on the boundary layer, I've used two meter temperature as a proxy for this. So the top row is the ensemble standard deviation in the two meter temperature. Middle row is the ensemble correlation between soil temperature in layer one and two meter temperature. And then the bottom row is the soil moisture, is the correlation between soil moisture in level one and the two meter temperature. Um, starting at the top row, you see even, and then I've got baseline on the left, my, perturb my applying perturbations every time step in the middle and then the SPPT on the right. Despite the fact that that middle experiment did add a reasonable amount of spread to the two meter temperature, it hasn't, uh, sorry, to the soil moisture and soil temperature states, which I didn't show. Um, it, it hasn't added much spread in the two meter temperature and where it has added spread, it's in dry, it's in dry conditions. And this is actually associated with the spread in soil moisture. Um, looking at the middle row, I think there's an interesting result here. In these two methods where I'm directly perturbing the soil state, this is actually reducing the, cor the cross component correlation between the soil temperature and the two meter temperature. And this makes sense because that correlation, the, the, the coupling that you get between the land and the atmosphere is, is caused when the atmosphere influences the land and then the land influences the atmosphere. If I then perturb one of those um, components, it makes sense that I'm gonna reduce that correlation slightly. Um, the bottom row shows, it's a bit of an aside, but an alarming result, um, which is highlighted most in the middle plot. This shows these plots are at 18 UTC. We're seeing a strong positive relationship between soil moisture and two minute temperature at nighttime in the GFS. Um, I've seen this before uh, and in many different ways. Um, and this is not, this is not correct. Um, it's, it's not what you see in other modeling systems. It's not what you see in observations. Um, and I wanna highlight this as, as an issue with the model um, rather than my perturbation method, but it really stands out um, in, in that middle experiment because I have introduced a reasonable amount of spread in the soil moisture. Um, and I just highlight this because this is an actual problem for DA. Like I, I originally started this work, I wanted to introduce a system to a similar, to update the soil moisture in the model through DA. And what this tells me is if I do this, it's probably going to, it is going to have a negative impact on the model temperature temperature. Okay, next slide. Okay, so based on those results, I didn't really like either of those methods. Um, the one didn't produce the correct distribution of model uncertainty and one just didn't introduce enough uncertainty. So I'm, I tried another method, which is to perturb the model parameters. 
Um, so we're stochastically perturbing key parameters that control the land atmosphere fluxes. Um, the motivation here is that like the SPPT, we have, there's the potential to get consistent perturbations between the soil temperature and soil moisture. And then there's the added bonus that we can also get consistent perturbations between the land and the atmosphere. Um, in the initial test, just to, to test how this method works, I applied a perturbation to the vegetation fraction of 10%, um, following a paper by um, someone else, uh, by Maria again, um, within PSL. Um, and the results are shown in this slide. So that top right plot there is the same plot you saw previously, but I've added the dark blue line, which is my um, vegetation fraction perturbation experiment. And you can see I've, I've, I've added about double the amount of spread that we got from the SPPT um, and maintained that, that shape that reflects um, my observed estimate with the red line. Um, so I quite like this approach based on that. Um, it, it's not enough by itself, but you know, perhaps we could perturb a couple of additional parameters to up that uncertainty. Um, then if we look at the impact on the two meter temperature, um, we actually get a larger increase in the two meter temperature spread relative to the increase in the soil temperature and soil moisture, which makes sense because we're, we're getting much closer to perturbing the, 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 um, the fluxes. In the original slide uh, methods where I was directly perturbing the soil states, I was perturbing the soil states and then relying on the physics of the model to transfer those perturbations through to the boundary layer. Here, I'm perturbing the fluxes directly. So it's just a little bit more, um, I'm perturbing the land atmosphere fluxes indirectly, well, more directly, there you go. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's a result that makes sense. And then the other interesting thing we see here is, is, is more evident in the bottom row is when I perturbed the soil states directly, I actually reduced the cross component correlations and now I'm actually increasing them. And again, this makes sense because this method sort of, the way that it works is, is, is effectively by, by um, making a consistent perturbation uh, to the soil, to, to the land and the atmosphere. Um, from a DA perspective, I think this is probably a good thing. Um, we, ironically, we might have to wind up washing back those correlations a bit if they get too strong, but, but I, I, it's certainly, um, I'm very interested to see what the impact of this is. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in summary, the NSEP ensemble spread and atmospheric forcing does appear to be reasonable. Um, directly perturbing soil moisture and temperature produces ensemble spread that reflects spatial patterns in soil moisture memory rather than the likely model uncertainty and this isn't going to be sufficient to add spread in wetter regions. This actually has implications for offline land DA since this is a very standard method that they use. Um, applying SPVT to the soil moisture adds very little spread and is limited by the need to only apply positive perturbations which I didn't talk about and also the very small deltas that you get most time steps. Directly applying perturbations to one component of a coupled system, for example, the land reduces the cross component, for example, land atmosphere ensemble correlations. I think this is an interesting result. Um, I'd be curious to see if the opposite applies as well. If we uh, directly add perturbations to the boundary layer, does that, does that, does that also reduce the land atmosphere um, cross component correlations in the ensemble? Um, and then finally, perturbing the model interface parameters can produce consistent perturbations in both components, um, which enhances the cross component error covariances. Okay, next slide, please, which is my last one. Okay, so in, just in quick conclusion and then the next steps of this work, um, clearly I need deadlines um, because my deadline to submit the pull request for this work was this presentation and I submitted it last night. Um, so if you want to have a go at this and fiddle with it, um, that should be in the UFS community um, system soonish. Um, if you do, please send me an email, let me know your results. I also have a paper draft that I can share with you. Um, and then finally, implications for ensemble-based land DA for the UFS, which is really why I'm doing this work. So the recommended method here is to int introduce land model uncertainty into the UFS ensemble, is to perturb a selection of model parameters. Um, and then the current experiments also highlight inaccurate land atmosphere physics, which I mentioned, that's that soil moisture temperature relationship, which is going to be problematic for DA. Um, and so at Ezreal, I'm beginning experiments to assimilate two meter temperature to update the soil temperature um, only, um, since this relationship appears to be reasonable. Okay, thanks, that's it. Thank you, Clara. Uh, so <laughs> you did use uh, 15 minutes uh, to give this great talk. So because uh, we have a lot of technical issues uh, in this session, we are actually 15 minutes later <laughs> than the schedule. Uh, 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 so uh, thanks uh, uh, for everyone's great talk and uh, for your patience. Uh, uh, next section will be uh, uh, chaired by uh, Tara. So I think we'd better to move on. So Tara, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ming. <clears throat> um, and uh, thanks also to Evan Kalina, who is going to be our moderator today. So Evan, um, do you want to go ahead and and uh, promote Mike Erickson to presenter? Or do you want me to do that?
Yes, I've just made Mike the presenter, and um, right. it looks like he's unmuted himself. So, Mike, I think all you need to do is put your slides into presenter mode, and you should be good. Great. Um, so, um, before we get started, um, just a reminder, we do need to the Slack um, feed that you are entering questions into. So, rather than entering questions at this time into the DA Ensemble Slack feed, go ahead and switch channels over to verification, evaluation, and post-processing. And um, just to give the presenters a heads up, um, I will flash my screen back on um, at 10 minutes into your talk, and I'll actually like, give you a reminder that you may want to be wrapping up somewhere about 11 to 12 minutes into your talk. So um, with that, I'd like to um, welcome our first presenter for the um, plenary session on verification, evaluation, and post-processing. Uh, Mike Erickson works at the Weather Prediction Center. He will be talking to us about the development of a WPC um, excessive rainfall outlook called Practically Perfect tool for the ver for verification and forecasting. And with that, Mike, you look like you're good to go. Thanks. Great. Thank you again, Tara. Thank you, Evan. Uh, so yeah, uh, I just wanted to talk about this Practically Perfect tool. It's a little bit different than the one SBC uses, but um, yeah, uh, basically, first off, what is Weather Prediction Center, WPC's excessive rainfall outlook? Um, basically, that is the probability that rainfall will exceed flash flood guidance within 40 kilometers of a point. There are four categories ranging from marginal to high. So that's analogous sort of to SBC's convective outlook, except for flooding. Um, and one of the main reasons why we looked into Practically Perfect was basically forecasters lacked uh, tools to evaluate day-to-day -day performance. The bulk that's a little bit easier, but at least day to day. Uh, so what is practically perfect? Well, it's meant to represent the best case forecast given perfect knowledge of the event. So basically after the fact, when you collect all your observations and proxies. And the way that works is there's two different tuning parameters. And what I have shown the top right figure here basically is all your observations and proxies for flooding that Weather Prediction Center uses. Uh, imagine this on a grid, if it floods or if there's a proxy for a flood, it's a one, otherwise it's a zero. One of the, one of the variables is your radius of influence. Uh, so you can expand that, that point to a 40 kilometer radius of one. Uh, and then the second one is basically your degree of smoothing uh, with the Gaussian filter. And that takes your zeros and ones and smooths them between zero and one or between zero and 100% probability. And the key is, is that's meant to represent your probabilistic forecast, if you will. Uh, so one of the things that we use, um, not just one, but several, uh, are proxies for flooding. There's not really a single reliable flash flood observation database. So we do have local storm reports and USGS gauge observations, but they're not without their issues, especially USGS is, is sort of limited in how much you can sample. Uh, so we use proxies such as rainfall analysis exceeding flash flood guidance, and also exceeding the five-year average occurrence interval. Um, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to take a look um, and run the practically perfect configuration with those a variety of different sensitivity studies, varying these degrees of freedom. So that radius of influence, we wanted to vary that between five and 40 kilometers for our proxies, but not our observations. Um, we kept those fixed at applying a 40 kilometer radius of influence. And we also wanted to vary the degree of smoothing of the Gaussian filter between 90 and 120 kilometers. And we did this over um, all of 2017 and compared that to the ERO. Uh, but we actually wanted to generate the practically perfect separately for three different fields, FFG exceedance, ARI exceedance, and then your observations. And the reason why we did that is that serves as sort of a consistency check. Usually with big events, we have all three of those types co-located in, in abundance. So if you have just a region of FFG exceedances, you average that up generally, you don't really get any higher than a 33% chance. So here the goal is to compare these sensitivity studies are practically perfect to our ERO probabilities. Uh, and what's shown here is on the x-axis are different smoothing radius, on the y-axis are radius of influence, um, and Basically, what we're looking for on the top plots is the region of zero bias. So the plots on the left are for the slight in the ERO, in the middle, the moderate, the right, the high category. We're not really looking at marginal right now. We're looking at a little bit higher impact. And we do see this region of zero bias uh, for all three. They're not quite in the same phase space, but they're there. 
And for critical success index or CSI, we generally see that region of maximum CSI, which is encouraging. So what we're looking for here is what is the region that we pick to, to create our standard practically perfect technique. Um, and I'm sort of blowing past some of the other things that we've done to determine the optimal technique. That was one of the main ones. But we found that for practically perfect, the radius of influence or ROI of 25 kilometers works best, and generally um, a Gaussian filter of 105 kilometers. So what we wanted to do is run this over a much longer period of time um, from January 1, 2015 to the end of 2018. Looking forward to extending that to the end of 2020 soon. Um, and then we want to take a look at how this practically perfect looks, especially in terms of spatial biases. So using our optimal configuration uh, that we could find, this is what that looks like. And it's important to note that practically perfect does have a little bit of a bias anyway. So what we're looking for in these plots are sort of spatial differences, if you will. This is practically perfect minus the ERO such that if you have a positive bias, then that means you have more practically perfects being issued than the ERO. Or you can interpret it another way to mean that um, there's less EROs issued. So from moderates, we note that over DC, that is particularly true. And when you go down into the Southeast, that is not. So what I take home from this is basically, at least relative to the Southeast, um, we are not issuing nearly as many, uh, nearly as many moderate EROs in the DC region. And this was actually noted uh, opposite issue over the Southwest United States, this little arch here over Arizona that corresponds to the topography. We just looked in July of 2018, there was a separate study that showed that where the flash flood warnings that were issued, and this is sort of outlined in the red shapes here, aren't very well co-located with the slights that the ERO is being issued. In other words, if you just take flash flood warnings as true indication of flooding, which is, is more of a proxy, but um, there's not a great co-location there. And that sort of suggests this negative bias that we see uh, in the plot I showed a little bit earlier. So um, one of the, this plot I wanted to show is basically given um, for day one here, given that we have practically perfect predict a slight how often did a slight actually occur in the ERO? And that was roughly about 85%, which is, which is fairly decent. And it reduces to about 70% on day three, which is encouraging. So, but one of the main reasons I wanted to actually craft this was just to ask the question for a given event, especially one that has just happened, did this event reach a moderate or a high in the ERO? So one somewhat recent event, May 1, 2019, uh, what's shown here, all these marks uh, are basically different flooding observations and proxies. And then the green contour is your ERO marginal. Uh, your, your orange one is your ERO slight. So this was a day three forecast. Um, and it's pretty good forecast. Maybe the orientation is a little bit off. We go into day two, orientation is better. The moderate has been introduced over a region where there seems to be a lot of reports. So that looks pretty good. And then day one, it was extended to the south, that moderate region. Perhaps they should have extended it to the north. But the question is, was this event truly a moderate? Um, and if it was practically perfect, that's shown over here on the plot on the left. Yes, this whole contour I'm outlining is a moderate. So it was a very large moderate and then perhaps even just barely reached a high threshold here. So uh, definitely that upgrade to moderate was justified in this case. Um, but one of the things that I definitely wanted to focus on was instead of using practically perfect after the fact, how can you use it to create a first guess field for the ERO. In other words, in a forecast sense, how can you create a product in, in operations where the forecasters can start to draw their ERO from? Um, and that's what we're shooting for here. So what we're using is WPC's probabilistic quantitative precipitation forecast or PQPF. Uh, in practice, you can use uh, NBM's PQPF. Uh, we can, I mean, you can use basically any, any ensemble that can create some sort of a calibrated probabilistic quantitative precipitation forecast. So um, what I am using here is comparing and plucking different percentiles of the PQPF and then seeing where they exceed flash flood guidance and ARI and deriving using the practically perfect technique, uh, comparing that to the ERO to see whether it has probabilistic potential. So the, the thing here, the, the thing to vary or test is what percentile do I pick from the PQPF? And that answer is a lot easier in a, in a cooler regime. Um, I'm sort of skipping the sensitivity results here, but I found things were pretty well at the 95th percentile PQPF when tape is less than 500. Um, but when it was more than 500, 
it got a lot more tricky and I needed for slight, moderate, and high to pick different percentiles here. And this is a relatively short verification period. So I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of expanding this. We only had data going back to 6-12-2018. So we will definitely expand this to the 2020 season here. Uh, but basically uh, this shows some contingency table stats separated by season just over that period. And this is basically comparing that first guess field to the ER over the time period. And what we find, I just want to focus on uh, bias, the blue bars. Winter, uh, pretty decently biased, generally bias of one. The spring, we have a little bit of a positive bias shown in the top right figure. Thankfully, summer, bottom left, is generally not biased, and that's where the majority of our events are happening. And the autumn uh, maybe has a slight negative bias in the bottom right figure here. And the, the challenge was the summer uh, in trying to derive PQPF uh, percentiles that. That, that actually were unbiased and at least somewhat skillful. So if we if we change things and tried to lower the spring bias, then we'd increase the, the, the autumn bias at the same time. So I think this performs pretty well. Uh, and what I have shown over here is just comparing our first guess field uh, that we just came up with to sort of our, our observed practically perfect, if you will. And this is just for day three. And I should point out during this time, Weather Prediction Center does not issue um, or at this time did not issue day three at the high category with the exception of Florence and Harvey. So we were really looking to, to see how well we could do with day three highs at this point. Uh, and looking at the heat maps between these two for this time, they are pretty decently comparable. And, and, and these events are also fairly well co-located um, and, and matching to the dates pretty well. And this figure in the bottom right here is sort of a low resolution reliability plot, just looking at uh, 0.1, which is slight, 0.2, which is moderate, and 0.5, which is high. And what we find in that case is these probabilities for the first guess field are calibrated, except for slight where it falls slightly above your, your definition for slight, which is between 10 and 20% here. So it does pretty well. Uh, but I did want to show a very recent demonstration of the first gas field. This is when Crystal Ball was taking its very west track um, back in June. And what this is, is your PQPF first gas field basically um, from day three and then kind of stretching all the way through to day one. So uh, the first contour is slight. And then as you get into the darker colors, there's a moderate. And even what's shown toward the end there, it was predicting a high. So, but the important thing to point out here is Initially, at day three, it was suggesting this event was a moderate. Um, and then we sort of have it kind of reduce the southern edge of that area and kind of retract off to the northwest and occasionally suggest that the highest threshold may reach over 0.5, which is a high. Now, if we look at the verification shown in the figure on the right, and this is the fill contour here, there was a very large moderate in the practically perfect uh, based on the observations with a very tiny, tiny high. So we can say that at least from verification, uh, we, we did at least achieve a moderate on this day. And this was a pretty decent forecast with a pretty strong signal suggesting this moderate out in day three, which is, which is encouraging. So uh, in conclusion, um, you can use practically perfect in two different ways. One is with observations to try to ask the question, was, was yesterday, did that reach a slight, a moderate, a high threshold in the ERO? Um, and, and that technique seems to work pretty well. And then you can apply it in another sense by using probabilistic quantitative precipitation forecasts to try to create a first guess field that also looks well. So um, yeah, basically uh, with that, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Um, Evan, do, you, do we have any questions from Mike? Currently, there are no questions in the Slack channel, no. Okay. Well, Mike, you were very efficient, um, <laughs> and we that being we're a little bit behind schedule. i give it like one more second, just in case someone wants to pop up a question. I think I sure. see a question in the DA Ensembles and Predictability. Ah. It looks like it. Good catch, Catherine. Has the ER ah. skill in Western Dryer State Spinning Salmon? Um, it, it has over smaller, um, we, we've looked at CONUS ERO skill and in terms of the Western states, we, we've done separate monsoon seasons and shown that, um, th looking at things like just flash flood guidance exceedance, it, you, you basically have 
things like LSRs pop a lot more um, and they become a lot more important out there than our proxies. And that was just a, just looking at one, one monsoon season, but we haven't looked at it over several. That's something we definitely want to do because it is, it is a little bit, a little bit different, a little wild out there. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so question and actually a shameless plug also. Uh, we have actually um, uh, added and vetted practically perfect um, and surrogate severe um, into MET plus. So um, moving forward, do you foresee trying to develop a, a MET plus base use case um, using those capabilities so that we can share this with the whole community? Yeah, um, I, I do think that would be a great idea. I, I didn't, I failed to mention that, uh, that this, the, this code uses MET as much as possible um, coded up about two years ago. So it does use a lot of the functions there, especially grid stat. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, can, I would definitely love to make this a use case in the near future. That would be great. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, in the interest of time now, um, let's move on to our next presentation. So if we can promote Bill Lambertson um, to presenter. Um, he is also from WPC um, and the University of Colorado series. Um, I forgot to mention that that is also my Mike Erickson's affiliation um, with series as well. And um, Bill will be talking about multi-model ensemble clustering um, at the Weather Prediction Center. So we can see your slide, that's good. Perfect. And we can hear you. So if you wanna go right, ahead great. and present, present mode, we'll be good. Sure, yep. All right, so. Uh, just to begin, I kind of wanted to begin with sort of like the motiv motivation for why we are doing ensemble clustering at the Weather Prediction Center. And, you know, the main problem is that the atmosphere is a chaotic system. So we need a way to represent the inherent uncertainty in forecasts, especially at longer lead times. Obviously, a long time ago, the solution to this was thought up, and that is ensembles. Hi, Bill. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm not seeing your slides advance. Oh, you're not? End. No. Okay. Let's see here. It says I'm sharing. Are you using uh, dual displays by any chance? No, I'm not. Yeah, okay. so I think you just need to put it in presentation mode. You have your cursor over the right um, location down in the lower right hand corner. Okay, it, it was in present mode on my screen, so I, I just put it in again. Yeah. yeah, it's not going into presentation. Okay, do you guys want to just load it up on your end? Because I'm not really, I mean, it's in present mode on my screen, so I'm not really sure if there's anything else I can do. Okay, do you want yeah. to um, do that? Okay. I'm happy to do that, Tara. Let me uh, bring up his slides and and Bill, you can just let me know when you sure. want to advance and I'll do that. Hold on for just a second. I have to make myself the presenter. Man, lots of technical difficulties this afternoon. There we go. Wrong one. <laughs> Hopefully that's okay. Yep, that's good. We can just go to the next slide. Okay, so yeah, as I was saying, uh, sort of the meteorological problem that we're trying to deal with with um, clustering is that the atmosphere is a chaotic system. So we need a way to represent the inherent uncertainty in forecasts, especially at longer lead times. And obviously the solution to this is ensembles. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, we can see that that solves one problem, but it sort of creates another problem. And this new problem is that we've exponentially increased the amount of data that we want people to look at when they're making a forecast but we didn't necessarily give them more time to make the forecast. 
So consequently, ensembles are often only used in their rudimentary form. So most people just typically look at the ensemble mean or the spaghetti diagrams, which I have an example of on this slide here. And so that kind of misses a lot of information that the ensemble contains and that we spend a lot of computer resources trying to create. So a potential solution to this is ensemble clustering because it can provide forecasters with more ensemble information without kind of overloading them with all of the data. Uh, if we go to the next slide. All right, so what is ensemble clustering? Essentially, it's a way to distill the ensemble down to a few forecast scenarios that are most prevalent among the ensemble's uh, membership. And the idea is that viewing ensemble clusters will allow forecasters to quickly assess areas of un uncertainty in the forecast and also different ways the forecast could play out. And this is essential for forecaster situational awareness as long as as well as communicating the forecast out to the public because especially in the idss age we're getting into more forecast scenarios and trying to educate people on how the forecast could be different and also i want to mention that ensemble clustering isn't necessarily new and there's a lot of different ways to do it but so far it's been mostly an academic exercise with little uptake by operational forecasters um, in the national weather service so if we go to the next slide. So at WPC, we began experimenting with multi-model ensemble clustering um, as part of our forecast experiments in our hydrometeorological test bed. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with the winter weather experiment or um, our, ex our extended range forecast experiment. So those are kind of two experiments where we started tinkering around with um, multi-model ensemble clustering. But basically over the past couple of years, we have tinkered around and we've settled on using a variation of, of fuzzy clustering to create uh, clusters of ensemble members from the 90 members of the global ensembles, which are the GEFs from obviously NCEP, the GEPs from the Canadian and the EPS from the European. And we do this for days three through seven. And these clusters are available to use on a website and we they have actually started to be used outside of WPC uh, particularly by Western and Central Region uh, WFOs. So I don't really have time to go through the nitty gritties of the fuzzy clustering methodology, but if you're interested, there's a great paper by Minghua Zhang and others at SUNY Stony Brook that kind of goes over the nitty gritty details. And basically what we've done is taken their methodology and sort of adapted it for our purposes. So if you are interested in more of the details, I recommend um, that paper. But if we go to the next slide, uh, for fuzzy clustering, there's basically three main steps. The first is calculate and interpret the first two EOFs of a given field over a set of ensembles. So for our particular um, interest, we're looking at sort of large scale weather and large scale storm systems. So what we're doing is we're calculating the first two EOFs of the 500 millibar heights because that will kind of show us the differences in large scale features that govern you know, the storm track as well as troughs and ridges, which kind of dictate where you're gonna have above and below normal temperatures. And so the next thing you do is you use K-means clustering uh, to create clusters of ensemble members based on their principal components for the EOFs, because obviously each ensemble member will have a principal component for those two EOFs, which kind of tells you how well that EOF um, is represented by that ensemble member. And then finally, the last step and the most important step is to view the clusters. So hopefully this will make more sense as we go through an example, because this is kind of best shown with an example. So what we're going to do is apply fuzzy clustering to the seven day forecast of the weather for this Thursday over the Western United States. So if you go to the next slide. All right, so this is where we have the first step, which is calculate and interpret the first two EOFs. So again, this forecast was initialized at zero Z on the 23rd of July. Um, and this is valid from 0Z on the 30th of July to 0Z on the 31st of July. And we have the first two EOFs here. Um, so in both of these plots here, what's contoured is the 90 member ensemble mean from the GEFs, the Canadian and the European ensemble. And then the color shading is the EOF. So on the left here, we have the first EOF and on the right, the second EOF. As we can see, there's looking at the mean field, we can see that there's a ridge over the four corners area stretching up to the north. And we also have a trough offshore of the west. If we look at the first EOF, we can see that it's a dipole basically centered on the trough axis. 
And that's basically telling us that the main area of uncertainty in this forecast is east-west position differences with the location of that trough um, offshore of the western U.S. And then if we look at the second EOF, we can see it's also a dipole, but we have lower values basically co-located with the axis of the trough, as well as higher values co-located with the axis of the ridge. So if you're going to physically interpret this EOF, basically it's telling us that there are also differences in the amplitude of both that trough and that downstream ridge. All right, so if you go to the next slide. So then what you can do is you can plot all 90 ensemble members in a phase space of principal components for EOF1 and principal components for EOF2, which I have done here. So we have principal components for EOF1 along the x-axis and principal components for EOF2 along the y-axis here. And I've already gone through and clustered this, but just you can see we have all 90 ensemble members, uh, the GEFs, which, which is in the green, the Canadian, which is in the red, and the European members, which are in the blue. And then I've also kind of just labeled the physical interpretation of what kind of each portion of the phase space represents physically. So basically the ensemble members, which have a principal component for EOF1 that's positive, those are the members that generally have that trough further to the west. Uh, members which have a principal component for EOF1 that's negative, those are the members that generally have that trough further to the east. Uh, for principal component two, the members that have a negative uh, principal component for EOF2, those generally have that trough less amplified. And then the members with the principal component for EOF2 that's positive, those are generally the members that have that trough being more amplified. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, so basically you have this phase space and then you can use the k-means clustering on that phase space to kind of uh, group the ensemble members into a set of clusters. So I've gone through and split it up into four clusters here. Uh, so if we see cluster one, which are the X's here, they're up in this part of the phase space. So if you just go to the next slide, generally cluster one will be the members that have that trough further to the east and more amplified than the mean of all 90 ensemble members. Uh, if we look at cluster two, which are the circles with the X's in it, they're down here in this part of the phase space. And those are the members that basically have that trough further to the east and less amplified than the mean of all 90 ensemble members. Looking at cluster three, which are the diamonds, they're down in this part of the phase space. So generally these are the members with that trough further to the west and less amplified uh, than the mean of all 90 ensemble members. And then finally, Cluster four up in this part of the phase space, those are the members with that trough further to the west and more amplified than the mean of all 90 ensemble members. So if we go to the next slide, that's basically how we come up with the clusters. But then this is the most important part. Um, and honestly, you don't even need to, if you're a forecaster, you don't even need to look at uh, the EOFs to kind of see what each cluster looks like physically or what the interpretation is physically. Because it'll be readily apparent once you just look at them. Uh, and that's what we have on this slide. We have the four cluster forecasts, as well as the mean of all 90 ensemble members. So in this particular slide, uh, the contours in each of these plots is the mean of the members that comprise that cluster. And then the uh, color fill is the uh, 500 millibar height anomalies with respect to the CFSR climatology. And at the top of each of these plots, it just tells you um, the membership of that cluster from each ensemble prediction system. So for example, cluster one, is two Canadian ensemble members or 10% of the Canadian ensemble, three GEFs members or about 15% of the GEFs ensemble, and 14 European ensemble members, which is 28% of the European ensemble, for a total of 19 members or 21% of all 90 ensemble members. So if you just look at the clusters, you can see that cluster one, which based on the EOFs and the phase-based interpretation, was supposed to be east and more amplified with the trough. And you can indeed see that, especially when comparing it to the mean of all 90 ensemble members. Cluster two is also east with that trough, but definitely less amplified. Uh, cluster three is west with the trough. It's probably even off the page and we have more um, ridging over the Western United States. And then cluster four, it's got a pretty potent trough, but again, it's located further to the west. So over at least the Western US, it's more dominated by ridging. So that's the um, forecast at 500 millibar heights, but what we're really concerned with is more of the surface parameters. So what we can do is take the ensemble membership from each of these clusters that we got from the 500 millibar heights, and we can look at um, some more surface related parameters. And that's what we have if we go to the next slide. 
So now we're looking at 24 hour precipitation forecast from each of those four clusters. So in this slide, uh, which each of these plots have contoured is the cluster mean for that cluster of the precipitation. And now this time what's shaded is the difference between that cluster mean as well as the total ensemble mean. So basically areas that are in the green and in the blues, that's where that cluster is wetter than the total ensemble mean. And areas that are um, more red shading, that's where it's drier than the mean of all 90 ensemble members. So no surprise if we look at cluster one with that trough of the Northwest, it's predicting more precipitation in that area. Looking at cluster two, which was further east with that trough, but maybe a little less amplified, Again, it's wetter, but since it's less amplified, most of the precipitation is confined to, say, the northern Cascades. And then cluster three and cluster four, which were further west with that trough and so had more ridging over the western United States, we can see that, especially in the Pacific Northwest, they're a lot drier. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, basically we're so showing the same thing, but this is for maximum temperatures. So now, Again, the contours show the mean for that particular cluster, and now the shading, again, is how that cluster differs from the mean of all 90 ensemble members. So no surprise, cluster one and cluster two, uh, which were the two clusters that had that trough more on shore of the west, we see a lot of blues indicating that they're forecasting maximum temperatures to be cooler over the uh, Pacific Northwest, whereas clusters uh, three and four are warmer. Uh, so if we go to the next Can slide. Up? Yeah, I'm, yep, I'm wrapping Perfect. up. So just putting it all together, a forecaster coming into work seven days prior to Thursday could view the 500 millibar EOFs and immediately see that the greatest uncertainty in the forecast was the location and amplitude of the trough offshore of the West. If they viewed the clustering products, it would help them see how differences in the large scale pattern affected precipitation and temperature over the Western US. And then they can also get an idea of how much each ensemble system is supporting a particular scenario. And this is useful information when making and communicating a forecast and the possible ways that it could unfold. Next slide. Um, so just future work, just quickly. The main thing is that we're very excited for the new guest, which is coming out. Obviously, that'll have 10 more members, and we're very excited to see how that will impact a product like this. And then finally, going to the next slide. As I said, all of this information is available on a website. So those are the websites there. All the images I showed in this PowerPoint were basically taken right off that website. So if you were interested, you can go to those links. There's also more training on those um, that kind of explain things maybe a little bit more thoroughly. And then also that great paper that is sort of like the basis for this uh, work. So with that, I'll just leave it there. And if there's any time uh, questions or in the Slack chat, I'll answer them. All right. Uh, I think we certainly have time for one question. Uh, Evan, do you have questions? Yeah, it looks like there is one question from uh, John Jong. He asks, do you have to pre-specify the number of the cluster or can you let the system determine the number of clusters? That's an excellent question. Um, for the k-means clustering that we're using, you generally have to specify beforehand. Uh, recently, we've done a lot of work uh, with kind of looking into other ways that do clustering, such as density-based scanning. Um, and I basically have tried out all the different um, clustering algorithms that are available um, in some of the Python statistical analysis tools. And unfortunately, the ones that are automated and that would determine the number of clusters without you having to specify, they're very hard to work with. You'll get great results for one case, and then you try the same uh, technique on another case and it won't work. So I think for now we're going to stick with the k-means clustering and just specifying for clusters beforehand because that's that seems to be the best thing that's working out so far. All right. Um, well, thanks again, Bill. Um, and once again, just a quick shameless plug, uh, MetPlus is uh, integrating EOFs into the Python side of its um, wrappers and so forth. So hopefully um, moving forward um, as this uh, methodology matures, you can help uh, contribute it to the community by making it available through MetPlus. That would be great. Yeah, I wasn't aware that they were adding EOFs, so. We, we are for some of our S2S work, so. Okay, so I guess um, in the interest of time, let's move on to our 
final presentation during this plenary session. Um, we can make Zhao Wang um, presenter. She's from University of Illinois um, at Urbana-Champaign, and she will be presenting developing a community suite of process-oriented model diagnostics for the unified forecast system. Hey, uh, can you see my screen okay? Mm, no. Okay. All right, did you hit the sharing up in the... Oh, okay, I thought I, it will be shared automatically. <laughs> Yeah, Joe, I, I sent your request, but you can also try to share your screen if you want. Um, it should be a little pop up, maybe that um, maybe it's hidden behind your uh, behind your go to. OK, uh, I was asked to uh, uh, to change the system setup, so I need to view the meeting and come back to make it work. So give me a one second. So while we're waiting for her to do that, um, I just uh, I'll put the shameless plug ahead of um, her talk and say that much of the work that she's presenting is being integrated into Met Plus um, as we speak. And will be available in our um, in our release of Met Plus 4.0 next spring. We weren't able to get it into the the releases coming out um, later this week, but it'll be available um, in like March April timeframe of 2021. And it looks like she's offline at this point. Hey, Zhao, I, I just made you presenter again. Sorry, running into some problems here. All right, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you for your patience. All right, so uh, we'll let you get started. Uh, do you see my title slide in the slideshow mode? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, this work is about a process-oriented model diagnostics for the UFS. The work uh, was supported by uh, NOAA, Rona 3, R2O initiative. Uh, it is done in collaboration with Tara Jensen, the co-PI of the project, and also uh, my graduate student, Doug Miller, Ankar Santis, uh, Wei Wei, David, Dan, and Tina. Okay. Uh, we know model evaluation is an important part of model development effort. Briefly speaking, uh, the performance-based metrics like uh, uh, ACC can provide us information about uh, how well the model does, but the uh, uh, process-based uh, diagnostics can provide insights on the possible sources of the uh, model deficiencies or model errors. The goal of this project is to transition capability into MetaPlus to improve the UFS prediction skill. Okay, so here uh, we have three levels of diagnostics. Level one, we focus on the model systematic errors like uh, moisture precipitation processes and uh, cloud macrophysics. In level two, uh, we look at uh, the sources of predictability for extended range forecasts like MGO, NAO, and the weather regimes. In level three, we uh, examine the high impact weather events or climate phenomena 
like uh, mid-latitude blocking and the tropical cyclones. This one is, uh, uh, is a schematic showing the structure of the metaplots. Here we have uh, the meta core and also um, meta database, uh, meta viewer and the meta, plot, uh, meta express. This project uh, contributes uh, specifically to the meta core and also uh, the output can be displayed uh, using meta calc pi and the meta plot pi, either in spatial plus or statistics plus. Overall, it offers the increased flexibility and the extensibility of the meta tools. In this one, uh, we see different uh, color codes for different types of uh, meta tools. We have reformat, plotting, statistics, and analysis tools using the different colors. And our project specifically contributed to greater diagnostic tools and the TCG tools, along with a couple other projects. So next, I will show some examples for the three levels of diagnostics. The model data we use here is uh, a mainly GEFS reforecast version two. And this one used the, uh, a rather old GEF, GEFS model version, version nine. We, I will also show, uh, show some products using FV3 GFS retrospective forecasts. But I should mention uh, the FV3 GFS data are only available for three or four years. We did not have a chance to look at the, uh, the newly available reforecasts. So due to the small sample size, some statistics may not be robust. The evaluation data sets include uh, satellite data and also reanalysis data. So first, the level one, systematic errors. In this one, we see uh, three panels regarding precipitation processes. Uh, let's first look at the right panel, which shows the precipitation as a function of column water vapor. The X axis shows the column water vapor, and the Y axis shows the precipitation. Uh, what we use here is uh, the GFS reforecasts. The blue curves represent a uh, uh, shorter fo forecast lead time. Dark blue is uh, um, one day uh, is one day forecast lead time, and the dark red is the uh, fifteen day forecast lead time. So you can see the uh, nonlinear increase of precipitation with column water vapor. But we can also see with increasing forecast lead time, the curves become flatter. So basically, uh, you can see in the um, in the drier regime the uh, red curves ab above the blue curves, which means the convection occurs too early in terms of moisture accumulation. But in the west, uh, in the wet regime, you can see the blue curves above the red curves, which means uh, with increase increasing forecast lead time, we uh, underestimate heavy precipitation. That can also be seen the uh, precipitation distribution difference on the left. The difference here is uh, with respect to observation. So the uh, positive values represent overestimate. You can see uh, light precipitation is overestimated and heavy precipitation is uh, underestimated. We know this is a common issue for global models. What we see here is uh, the, the, uh, this model bias can be linked to uh, cumulus parameterization or more specifically the uh, convective entrainment rate. The second panel here shows the, the histogram of, co of column water vapor. You can see uh, with increasing forecast lead time from uh, blue to red, you can see the peak shift to the left, which uh, indicates uh, uh, increasing dry bias. The bottom panel shows the FV3 G, uh, GFS. We can look at the three curves. The uh, green dashed curve is uh, initialization of day zero data. And the black solid curve and the dashed curves represent a five day and a 10 day, uh, 10 day forecasts. We can see there is a, a shift between day zero and day five. That is due to the uh, initialization shock because the model was initialized using ECMWF analysis without a data assimilation cycle. But from five day to 10 day forecasts, we can see the curve does not change much which is different from the increase in dry bias we saw in the uh, GFS reforecasts. That means uh, uh, 
the new uh, the new physics in the uh, FE three G, uh, GFS performs more realistically. Now let's take a quick look at the uh, the mean field biases. What we see here is uh, uh, eight day forecast biases. We have column water vapor on the top and the precipitation on the bottom. Blue colors represent negative biases and the uh, orange colors represent positive biases. I want to highlight the uh, negative biases or the dry biases over Western Pacific monsoon region. We will come back to this point later when we discuss tropical cyclones. So now uh, level two, sources of predictability. This one shows the wave number frequency diagram for MGO. You can see uh, in each panel, the left part represents westward propagation, and the, west, uh, the right part represents eastward propagation. And the MGO is highlighted by uh, the peak here, which has the uh, wheel number one and the period about uh, 40 or, uh, or 50 days. From top to bottom, we have uh, ERA reanalysis, GFS analysis, five day, 10 day, and 15 day forecasts. You can see uh, the analysis is very close to ERA reanalysis, but uh, at a 15 day forecasts, the MGO magnitude has been reduced by about 70%. This one shows the time height cross section of relative humidity based on a local MGO index. The zonal axis shows time from 25 days before to 15, uh, 15 days after the peak of the MGO and the vertical is uh, uh, vertical uh, shows uh, pressure levels. Again, uh, we have like a different forecast lead times. Due to the uh, propagation speed error in the uh, reforecasts, you can see the moisture field is off from uh, peak convection with increasing forecast lead time. And also, I want to highlight the two features. In the real analysis or, GF, or GFS analysis, we can see the uh, low level moistening leading the uh, peak convection and also upper level moistening following the peak convection. These are, these are, are, are related to cumulus convection and the stratiform precipitation processes. But both are, are kind of like either absent or underrepresented in the, re uh, in the reforecasts. Now uh, let's look at uh, a different phenomena. This one is uh, this one shows the weather regimes. Weather regimes are recurrent weather patterns. What we see here is uh, uh, this one shows uh, uh, four weather regimes over uh, over North America, uh, mainly United States, from ERA interim. We have uh, this is from uh, three summer seasons. For uh, the four the four weather regimes have. Uh, decreasing frequency occurrence. Okay. Now, if we look at uh, FA3 GFS, this one shows the five-day forecasts. We can see the spatial patterns are very, uh, are very close to each other. But uh, there are some differences in the frequency of occurrence. In particular, in the uh, FA3 uh, GFS, we can see uh, regime three and regime four are switched compared to the real analysis. Due to the uh, due to the uh, different frequency occurrence, but I should mention uh, since this is only based on three summer seasons, the statistics may not be very robust. Okay, last part: high impact weather. This one shows the uh, tropical cyclone genesis density function, which is the sorry, which is the, uh, the number of tropical cyclones forming within a grid cell. From uh, the first panel shows observation best track data. The second panel shows the GFS one day or uh, one week reforecasts. And the bottom panel shows the difference. You can see on um, over Western Pacific, it is underestimated. Over Eastern Pacific, we have a southeast uh, world, world shift. Over Central and Western Atlantic, we also have negative biases. Okay. For the interest of time, uh, we will mainly focus on uh, the biases over Western Pacific. Here we used uh, the uh, Genesis Potential Index to analyze the sources of uh, so the source of the biases. As shown in the formula here, the Genesis Potential Index represents the statistical relationship between large-scale environmental conditions and the Genesis frequency. 
here we have uh, absolute vorticity, relative humidity, and the vertical wind shear. We will uh, mainly look at uh, relative humidity. The panel on the, uh, on the top shows uh, the improvement of Genesis frequency we will get if we reduce the relative humidity biases. So you can see we have a uh, positive, we have increase of positive values over Western Pacific, which means that if we fix or reduce the uh, moisture bias in this region, Genesis frequency can be um, can can be reduced. Can you start wrapping up, please? Sure. Okay. The bottom panel shows the, uh, what we see earlier, and the uh, the the bias here can be linked to the uh, negative biases or dry biases we saw earlier. Okay. Uh, this uh, this one shows the uh, blocking frequency. Uh, the frequency uh, the frequency of instantaneous blocking as a function of longitude. The red curves repre uh, represent uh, uh, five day and a ten day forecasts from FE three GFS, and the blue curve represents um, real analysis. We can see uh, with the five day forecasts we have very good agreement, but in the ten day rate forecasts. The peak on uh, over Central Pacific is underestimated. Okay, the last slide is a summary. Uh, briefly speaking, uh, we have a three level uh, diagnostic suite for process oriented model evaluation for the GFS. For the UFS, uh, the products are, are being transitioned to MetaPass. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, so do we have any questions for um, for her, Evan? Uh, yes, we have a couple of comments and a question. Um, I can go through them in order. The, the first is a comment from YJ Kim. Blocking can also be diagnosed by NAO and AO. So there is some gray area between the levels two and three. In any case, these diagnostics are going to be very useful for identifying systematic model biases. Okay, uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, blocking can also be regarded as kind of like a one type of weather uh, weather regimes. In that sense, uh, due to its like a, a long duration or persistence, it can also be regarded as a source of predictability for shorter term phenomena. Oh, we have time for one more. Okay, uh, the next is a question from Ligia Bernarday. Uh, she wants to know what tool was used to detect genesis and GEFs? My experience is results can be very sensitive to the genesis detection tool. What we used here is, uh, is the GFDL vortex tracker, uh, tropical cyclone tracker, which is also available from MetaPass. I, um, you are right. Like uh, uh, the, there are many. Uh, there is a long list of parameters in the uh, vortex tracker. You, uh, users can prove, which uh, depends on the um, like the model resolution. But I would say that some of the biases cannot be fixed even using like uh, even by tuning the parameters. Okay, I think at this point we're going to need to um, wrap up, especially being we're 23 minutes over. Um, I do want to give our uh, uh, thank you to all of our presenters this afternoon. Um, great job, very interesting talks, and also give our organizers an opportunity to make any announcements. So, Catherine or anybody else, do you want to say anything about tomorrow? Uh, as long as no one else is, I, I don't think so. We begin again tomorrow in a plenary session at um, 11 a.m. Eastern. Okay, and yeah, that'll be um, also focused on verification, evaluation, and post-processing, correct? Yes. Yeah, just right. a quick comment uh, for yeah. presenters uh, tomorrow morning. If you could sign in a little early, um, maybe 20, 10, 20 minutes before we start, we can practice the screen share. And also please upload your slides to the Google Drive for this plenary session. And that way we have a backup. Thanks.
All right. Well, once again, everyone, thank you for attending this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.